I'm the director of the Americas program here at CSIS. Um, we need to make a security announcement before we begin today. We're required to share our building safety precautions. Overall, we're secure in this building, don't worry, but as a convener, we have the duty to be ready for any emergency situation. Please follow my instructions in, uh, should the need arise. The emergency exit pathway for this room is the stairway behind you to the ground floor and outside the main entrance. Today's uh, presentation is a part of what we call the, Marine, the Maritime Security Dialogue. Uh, this dialogue brings together CSIS and the U.S. Naval Institute, two of the nation's most respected nonpartisan institutions. The Chief Executive Officer of the Naval Institute is Vice Admiral Pete Daly, who is with us today. The series is intended to highlight the particular challenges facing the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard from national level maritime policy to naval concept development and program design. This dialogue series is made possible with the, the very generous support of Lockheed Martin and Huntington Ingalls Industries, HII. We thank them very much for their support. Today's discussion is with Admiral Kurt Tidd, the commander of the U.S. Southern Command. Admiral Tidd was commissioned from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1978, received his master's degree in political science from the University of Bordeaux, and is a graduate of the Armed Forces Staff College. At sea, he commanded U.S. Naval Forces Southern Command and the U.S. Fourth Fleet, as well as Carrier Strike Group 8 aboard the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower during a combat deployment supporting coalition forces in Afghanistan uh, during Operation Enduring Freedom. Ashore, he served as the 35th assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and spent three years at the White House on the NSC staff as Director for Strategic Capabilities Policy and Director for Combating Terrorism. Our format this morning, uh, Ambassador T uh, Admiral Tidd is going to make his presentation of 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and then this will be followed by a question and answer period. Um, the floor is yours, Admiral Tidd. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. You know, I've, I've been accused of far worse things than, than being called an ambassador, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. And particularly in today's uh, day and age where we work so closely with the Department of State, I'd, I take that as a, as, as a high compliment indeed. So good morning, and to all of you who are here, it's uh, wonderful. I look out in the audience, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces, some in uniform, some used to be in uniform, and some that maybe someday will be wearing uniforms. So I think uh, all the way around, this is uh, uh, it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to to be able to to share just a few ideas. The opportunity to come here to CSIS is a is a, a real thrill. This is one of the hallmark institutions, and the partnership between CSIS and the U.S. Naval Institute, I think, is a, it's a, a natural partnership, and it goes back to the days of Arleigh Burke, uh, one of the uh, the patrons, I think, of uh, of, of modern naval leadership. So uh, it's it's a an honor to be able to be here and speak with you. So. To help frame today's discussion, what I'd like to do is just give a very quick rundown of how U.S. Southern Command is looking at maritime security challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean, and then we might expand a little bit beyond that. So if I were talking to you in 1986, or even in 1996, or maybe even in 2006, I'd be telling you that drug trafficking is the significant security challenge in this part of the world. Back then, everything from the FARC in Colombia to violence in Central America seemed to be connected in some way or another to the drug trade. It was pretty clear cut. Narco traffickers moved narcotics from South America to the U.S. in the maritime domain. We knew what the threat was and where it was and how best to combat it. But somewhere along the line, something changed. And in 2016, drugs alone are no longer the main thing that we have to worry about. Neither are the millions of people who are trafficked through the region, nor the thousands more who are smuggled on the high seas in hopes of reaching our shores. The myriad illicit commodities that move through our hemisphere as part of a global flow of illicit goods and services isn't the main challenge either. Instead, it's the amorphous, adaptable, and networked threats enabling these illicit flows that keep me up at night. Transregional and transnational threat networks, and not the commodities that they move, are the real threat to our nation's security and the region's stability. The threat lies in the ability of these networks to connect people and groups and dangerous 
uh, all uh, people in groups dangerous in their own right, much more so though when empowered by others. These networks as a whole and in their parts are woven into the fabric of our environment and societies. And I would argue that these networks are pressing problems that we as a whole of government don't fully understand, especially as it relates to the world we live in today. A world in which these networks and the growing illegal economies that support them undercut our national interests in multiple nations, multiple continents, and multiple regions and domains. Wherever they exist, in whatever form they take, be it extremist, criminal, or even state-sponsored, threat networks are a significant challenge facing every nation in the Western Hemisphere. In the maritime realm, their sophisticated operations pose a threat to the safety of navigation, to human life, to maritime trade, and to the social and economic well-being of coastal and landlocked states. There are many different networks, just as there are many disparate goals and creative methods for conducting illegal activities. Some networks, like violent extremist ones, are ideologically or politically motivated. They focus on spreading their influence and moving money, weapons, and people. While criminal networks are focused on accumulating wealth and power by satisfying a market demand for an illicit service or commodity. Some networks smuggle desperate people from all over the world into our country, where they go on to find jobs or refuge from conflict, while other networks specialize at moving individuals with questionable backgrounds, worrisome intentions, and possible ties to terrorism into the United States via a long and circuitous route. Sometimes starting in South America, up through Central America and Mexico and into the United States. Some networks have cornered the market on cocaine trafficking and some dabble in polycrime activities. Some networks engage in small arms smuggling via maritime conveyances and some networks possess the highly coveted expertise to build semi and fully submersible to semi and fully submersibles that are capable of reaching our shores unassisted and undetected over long distances. And whether their crimes are committed at sea or on land, the effects of these different networks are felt across our communities and in some cases across countries and continents. So what does all this mean for the maritime security of the Western Hemisphere? Well, for one thing, it means that we require a different way of thinking about this challenge and how we can help combat it. Thinking differently involves challenging our assumptions. We'd all do well to remember that near things are important too. Now while we must pay attention to the seas and oceans around the world, we shouldn't lose sight of what's going on in the waters around our own home. It also means challenging ourselves, and so at Southcom, we're lifting our sights from an exclusive focus on a single illicit commodity, drugs, and instead we're challenging ourselves to take a networked view of the environment. That means thinking and acting in multiple domains, embracing cross-functional teams, tearing down stovepipes, developing staff to embrace complexity and alternative viewpoints, and constantly learning, adapting, and applying new approaches and ideas. Part of this shift comes from a candid recognition that for years we've been triaging the symptoms of the problem rather than addressing the root problem itself. And in that time, the problem has adapted and grown in complexity, while our efforts to address it have lagged behind. Thinking differently also applies to those of us that make up the friendly networks. Collectively, we would all benefit from a better understanding of ourselves while we are integrated well in certain areas, we can always do better. Different players have different pieces of the puzzle, but it's not always clear how those pieces fit together or how the not-so-friendly networks operate and interact. Each of us has glimpses of financial flows, 
a partial understanding of the centrality of particular routes and nodes, an expanding knowledge base about how various types of networks come together and interact with one another, a recognition that corruption is a huge part of the problem, and a nagging sense that we're using 20th century approaches to fight 21st century threats. Broadly speaking, everyone in the friendly network knows what needs to be done. We need to increase regional maritime cooperation, real-time information sharing, and multinational operations. We need to continue building and reinforcing bonds of trust across and between our own military, law enforcement, diplomatic, and intelligence communities, fusing these bonds bilaterally and multilaterally with our key partners. We need to explore innovative technologies that don't just make us smarter, but also better. We need to support more operations like Homeland Security Investigations Operation Citadel, which is fast becoming the model for DOD support to countering threat networks in the Western Hemisphere. Thinking differently about networks also means that we need to think differently about our requirements. We need to be more effective in using what we have, more discriminating in how we use it, and more adaptive and creative in seeking alternative ways to fill capability gaps. Now the good news is we've got a solid foundation to build on. Every year, our Joint Interagency Task Force South and its extensive international and interagency network supports hundreds of maritime interdiction operations. Those operations net hundreds of arrested drug traffickers, each one a node in an illicit network of its own. Law enforcement leverages the evidence and testimony from these lower level traffickers to further investigate and indict their superiors and ultimately to dismantle the larger threat networks. The task force's counter threat finance cell is supporting money laundering investigations through network analysis and the targeting of bulk cash smuggling that is the financial lifeblood of threat networks. Their cyber and container initiatives use advanced analytics to fuse commercially available data, processed reporting, and open source intelligence to identify how an individuals or organizations exploit cyberspace to move illicit commodities via commercial conveyances. We'd like to find ways to do more of this kind of work because it's exactly what's needed in a counter network approach. Our Coast Guard partners are also leaning forward. Coast Guard Commandant Admiral Paul Zunka has committed to maintaining an increased presence in cutters as well as a commensurate plus up in maritime patrol aircraft throughout our region in order to get after these threat networks in the Western Hemisphere. This support is especially critical as the Navy decommissions its frigates and P-3 aircraft and awaits the full deployment of its new line of littoral combat ships and its fleet of P-8 Poseidon aircraft. In essence, the Coast Guard is enabling us to meet our Title X statutory obligations and deterring human smuggling. There's a reason why we in SOUTHCOM refer to the Coast Guard as SOUTHCOM's Navy. So speaking of the littoral combat ship, when it comes to Navy requirements, SOUTHCOM has historically done a lot with very little. Rarely do we need a carrier strike group. And given global priorities, we probably wouldn't get one anyway. So that means we have to be realistic and creative in finding sourcing solutions. We'd like to pursue opportunities to meet this demand by leveraging Navy ships transiting our region and other unconventional solutions. Navy ships have to travel between the east and the west coast of the United States on a regular basis. Therefore, they come directly through our region, and we need to come up with more creative ways to be able to take advantage of their presence. While en route, why not stop for up to, up to a week in order to conduct port visits, bilateral, bilateral exchanges, and short duration exercises. If we could bring this kind of thinking into the future concept design for ship transits, we could provide low cost training opportunities and visible, consistent, 
U.S. Navy presence in a part of the world where it has been in far too short supply lately. Additionally, integrating ships from Navy bases in the southern United States could provide underway training, bilateral engagement opportunities, and show that the United States' continued commitment to the region continues. Given the non-kinetic and low threat environment in our region, ships in the early phases of training could be employed in viable, critical mission sets against threat networks operating in the dark, asymmetric maritime domain. For example, while littoral combat ships are in their early phases of commissioned service and crew integration, we could leverage the ship, its crew, and available berthing for regional training teams and network mapping experts for short duration deployments to Latin America or the Caribbean. We see this kind of creative application of sea power as a win-win for the Navy and for the Southern Command region. The Navy gets a great target-rich training environment while we get some much needed help filling our capability gaps. However we get them, the presence of Navy or Coast Guard ships is critical to our counter-threat network approach. Both services have unique capabilities to engage threat networks where they are most vulnerable to disruption in the maritime domain. A gray hull, a gray hull or a white hull with an orange stripe still sends a powerful deterrent message. It also sends a clear message to our adversaries and a reassuring one to our friends. The Navy and the Coast Guard have important roles to play in supporting counter-drug operations, detection and monitoring, and capacity building efforts. These are both integral parts of a counter-network approach. These efforts are also the foundation for enduring and cooperative maritime security. That won't change. So I guess you could say what's really changing is our goal. Until now, we focused on what we can diminish or degrade, how many metric tons of cocaine we can disrupt, how many coca or marijuana plants we can help eradicate. And while that remains important, it's time that we start building something too. What we're driving toward is better integration, better understanding, and better support to law enforcement efforts. Ultimately, we want to help our partners in the U.S. government and across the region build a network that is stronger, more adaptive, and more interconnected than any threat network can ever hope to be. Now, lest you think that the Navy's old salt has contracted Caribbean fever, it's important to point out that this network perspective applies all around the globe and on the seven seas, not just in the Caribbean. Networks of state and non-state actors are active in the Black Sea and the South China Sea. Little green men and their network of surrogates or commercial fishing and shipping fleets are as engaged and in play as traditional naval orders of battle. This is true below the threshold of conflict and it won't change during a conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to start thinking about networks, both theirs and ours. So with that, let me conclude, and I look forward to taking some questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Admiral Tidd. That was great. Uh, a perfect presentation for this maritime security dialogue that fit in uh, very, very well. Um, first, I'm going to ask a few questions, and then we're going to turn to, to the audience. Um, first of all, I understand this past weekend you were in Haiti. Yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you found down there? Sure. Uh, what's, what's happening on the island? You know, I, I think uh, as, as everyone recognized, um, the region that we live in is a region that is prone to all manner of natural disasters from earthquakes, fires, floods, volcanoes. And so uh, this time of year is the time of year that, uh, that hurricanes are, are prevalent. Um, tragically, uh, Hurricane Matthew, as it made its sweep through the Caribbean and, uh, and headed up north and before it arrived off the east coast of the United States, uh, it, uh, it, it ran over the southwestern tip of, uh, of Haiti uh, and, and essentially devastated that whole region. Um, the, 
Uh, I think we've also had a chance, we've seen the imagery, uh, and we understand just exactly how, uh, how a, a part of the world that already uh, suffers uh, it, uh, uh, had to re uh, endure uh, further um, uh, devastating destruction. So uh, what uh, I've been able to observe, and it's, uh, it's my second visit to Haiti uh, in about the last two, uh, 10 days, uh, is a significant progress from the very earliest days. Essentially, uh, the day after the, um, the, earthquake, or the, uh, the, the hurricane passed through, uh, we were able to surge um, U.S. military aircraft in. Uh, U.S. Southcom has uh, organic to it, a, an Army aviation detachment, and six months out of the year, a uh, Marine Corps Special Purpose uh, Marine Air Ground Task Force that is uh, based in Honduras. Uh, we were able to begin to move, actually, as the hurricane was, uh, was moving through the Caribbean, started moving towards, um, towards Haiti. At the time, we weren't sure exactly where the need might be, uh, but uh, we started it moving so that by the time uh, the hurricane had passed through, we were able to come in behind it, and uh, in very short order, were able to be on the ground, set up a joint task force, and begin to move, uh, I guess, provide that very critical, unique enabler that the U.S. military brings, which is the ability to move fast and to, to be able to move uh, heavy loads of, uh, of life-saving uh, humanitarian goods, food, medical supplies, shelter, those sorts of things uh, out to the hardest hit areas uh, at the same time that the international community was working to open up the road networks uh, from Port-au-Prince uh, out to the, the southwest corner. So in the, over the days as we were building up the stockpiles at the distribution nodes and supporting the uh, humanitarian organizations already on the ground that uh, our US, uh, uh, USAID and Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance works with on a routine basis. Uh, we were able to work in support of them providing the, the, uh, the life-saving uh, stores, which then the NGOs and the other international community was able to distribute out to the people uh, who needed it the most. Uh, we're at the point now where the, uh, the roads uh, are largely open. Uh, the amount of material that's moving over the roads uh, has increased uh, over time, and so we're seeing now that the, the requirement for our aircraft to be able to deliver uh, goods is, is dropping off, and I suspect that we're close to the point where we will probably say this unique military capability is no longer required, and uh, the, the, uh, our ambassador and uh, USAID have both told us that they think that, uh, that we will be able to start re redeploying our forces soon. But make no mistake about it, the, uh, the international community will be involved in working closely with the Haitian people for some time to come. Okay, oh great, thank you. Um, what adjustments has Southcom made with the expansion of the Panama Canal um, recently? Is, is that something that you've had to figure into your operations? Uh, well, I think, um, you know, as that, that expansion has been underway for, for a number of years, and so we've been watching and we recognize that uh, uh, that this would lead to an increase in the flow, particularly of the large uh, Super Panamax vessels. The Coast Guard has made adjustments, and that's one of the reasons why they've increased the number of Coast Guard cutters that are, uh, are present in the Caribbean, not just for the, uh, for the um, detection and monitoring mission that they're, that they're engaged in. And so uh, basically working closely with partners, uh, with the partner nations on the, uh, uh, through the Caribbean, there's a recognition that there will be more traffic, more shipping, and therefore a greater need to provide for maritime security in that region. And that's, I think that's uh, allowed some of our uh, signature exercises that, uh, uh, that we conduct, uh, whether it's the maritime exercise UNITAS, uh, that is the, the longest running maritime exercise in the world, uh, to Panamax, which is our large uh, uh, joint and multinational exercise that specifically focuses on the defense of the Panama Canal. The countries that participate uh, recognize the critical importance of, of that key piece of geography, and uh, the nation of Panama has, uh, has, has, has taken on uh, a responsibility to, uh, to participate very, very actively in these, uh, in these exercises. So this last year's, uh, this Panamax exercise that we uh, completed this summer, uh, one of the largest, and for the first time ever, all of the critical component commanders, uh, that those positions were exercised by partner nations. And so it, uh, the, the complexity of the exercise and the seriousness with which uh, the, the regional nations take the security of the Panama Canal, I think, is, uh, has increased in importance. Great. A, question on, uh, a couple of questions on Colombia. Uh, one, what do you make of the, uh, of the peace agreement and the prospects for the peace agreement? And, and second, um, 
Colombia is what you call a net exporter of security services, and uh, what the Colombians are doing in Central America, in particular, in, in helping in training uh, some of the, the troops of uh, the Northern Triangle countries is, is a demonstration of, of what the, our ISP director, Cap Hicks, would call federated defense, a sharing right. of the defense, defense responsibilities with some of our allies and partners in the Americas. What, what, is your, uh, what can you say about that federated defense um, concept sure. and Colombia's role in, uh, and other countries, what other countries uh, are already playing and what other countries could play a role in, sure. in that federated defense? I, you know, I think uh, Colombia is a, is a country that we, we single out as a country with whom we have a special relationship, and it's because for over two decades now, we've been standing shoulder to shoulder as they have gone from literally standing on the precipice of being a failed state to a, to a country that is, is um, very, very close uh, uh, to achieving a, uh, a, a peaceful conclusion to a, a, a civil war that's run for over 50 years. Over the course of, the, of our, our relationship, they have developed a very capable, very effective military uh, in, in all of its, uh, its aspects. Um, I think uh, as we look at the results of the, of the referendum, um, I, I, I can tell you that uh, the Colombian people themselves uh, have an enormous desire to, to achieve peace. And I think as we look at the results of that referendum, it, uh, it does not indicate that there is uh, any, any reduction in a desire for peace. There, I think, is, uh, remains uh, discussion over, over what constitutes a, a complete, fair, and, uh, and equitable peace deal. The Colombian people will resolve that. They'll, they're, they're working, they're meeting, and, uh, and discussing it. In the meantime, we will continue to stand by them as we have for the last two decades and continue to work together as we, we deal with shared security challenges. Uh, speaking of the role that they play, uh, they are a critical partner uh, as we work with some other countries in Central America that, uh, similar to the situation that, uh, that Colombia experienced, uh, are, are facing enormous insecurity challenges. Colombia has great credibility in sharing the lessons that they have learned over how best to, uh, to, to work through these problems, to, to explain that this is, a, this is a challenge that will require not just military force, but a whole of government approach, which Colombia very effectively a applied. It will require real political uh, skin in the game on the part of, of, of the entire nation. When Colombia tells that to a, uh, to, a, to a country in Central America, that, that carries a lot of weight as opposed to somebody from, uh, from outside of Central America or outside the, the immediate region. So Colombia is, uh, is a very helpful partner, and, and they continue to look for ways that we can work together in order to, to extend security. Um, they are, uh, along with a, a couple of other um, countries in the, in the region, a Pacific-facing nation. Uh, they have participated and are beginning to explore opportunities to work with, uh, with our U.S. Pacific Command, but also working with other countries in the Pacific that might be able to benefit from some of the special training and skills that uh, the Colombian military has. So we're investigating and working very closely with them uh, as they work their way through that. Other nations that, uh, that, that clearly are, are net exporters of security, I think you have to call out Brazil. It's a major power. It is a country that has... Uh, shouldered enormous leadership responsibilities in U.S. peacekeeping operations, most notably uh, the <clears throat> long-running Haiti uh, peacekeeping operation. The Manusta uh, commander is a, a Brazilian uh, general officer who uh, we have worked with closely, and, and right after the, uh, the passage of the hurricane, we immediately linked up with him, and we worked very closely with Manusta to, to make sure that our efforts were coordinated with uh, the work that they have ongoing on the ground. Uh, they're also leading peacekeeping operations in uh, Unifil uh, off, of, uh, off of Lebanon. So um, this is a country that uh, is, uh, has significant capabilities and is, is willing to shoulder the responsibilities of being a, a security leader. Chile also and, uh, and Peru are two other countries that I would single out as having significant capabilities and opportunities and are working very, very closely in supporting the efforts. But also uh, countries that you might not think of as, uh, as, as being significant net, net exporters of security like El Salvador, uh, have uh, deployed a helicopter detachment to the UN peacekeeping, UN peacekeeping operation off of Mali, or in Mali, rather. So, so that just goes to show that there are, there are a number of countries here in our region who have uh, significant capabilities and, uh, and are interested, I think, in being constructive partners on a global scale. Great. One country that's very close to my heart is Argentina. I've spent mm -hmm. about 13 of the last 15 years living down there, working at the embassy and then uh, working in the private sector. Um, how do you assess the changes that took place in Argentina 10 months ago? And, and uh, Argentina 
as a major non-NATO ally. It's the only, the only country in the Americas with that designation. Uh, do you see uh, sure. potential? Or, I, I, I think so. Um, I, this was, um, as, as you well know, uh, the uh, many members of the Argentine military have, uh, have gone to our war colleges, have trained at our various schools, and, uh, and we have a, a longstanding relationship. They're a professional military. Um, for a number of years, uh, about a decade, they were uh, prevented from being able to, to work with us. Uh, that door has opened back up again, and what we are doing is, uh, is looking for ways that we can try to recover those 10 years of, uh, of, of, of personal contact. I think uh, if, you, if you look at um, incredibly valuable programs that, uh, that uh, Congress supports uh, and that, uh, that, that we work with that, that are administered by the Department of State, uh, our IMET program, uh, where we are able to provide training opportunities for people to actually come over and spend time here in our country and get to know who we really are, as opposed to how we might be represented uh, in uh, uh, either in, in popular culture or in the in the in the local press. And they, they really get a, a much more profound understanding of who we are, what our values are, how we work, and, and uh, that has enormously helpful um, uh, benefits. And and it, it builds that that critical human-to-human -human connective tissue that has allowed us to be able to, to resume working together. I think, uh, I, I think as, as we look ahead, uh, Argentina, obviously, they, they have to do, um, they've, they've got some economic challenges as they, as they again, reco recover and reintegrate back into uh, the global economy, and they're, uh, they're eager to find ways to recapitalize uh, some, some of their military forces that have been neglected for a decade, uh, but they're looking for ways, principally through peacekeeping operations, again, to be able to, uh, to play a role, play a, uh, a very helpful role that, uh, in, uh, on a global scale. Great. A question on Cuba. I mean, the U.S. opening to Cuba is obviously in the early stages. Um, how, do you, how do you think about that, and uh, what might the implications be for SOUTHCOM operations if... Uh, if sure. relations move forward uh, even further. You know, I, I, I think that is going to be a relationship that will probably move forward at a pace driven largely by Cuba. Um, and as it stands right now, we, are, uh, we have had a number of security conferences, regional security conferences. Uh, a year ago, uh, very shortly after I, I, I took command, we had a Caribbean nation security conference in which uh, Cuba was invited to participate and they actually sent a delegation. It's the first time that that had happened, and, I, and the benefit of them being there was, for the first time, we could have a security conference where instead of the topic of conversation from the other security partners was not, you know, United States, how come you won't talk to Cuba? We actually talked about the matters that we cared the most about. So it took that large distracting element off the table and allowed us to, uh, to deal with, uh, with challenges that, uh, that are important to all of us. Um, I, I'm under no illusions. I don't think that this, this, uh, this relationship will evolve rapidly, but you know, we in the military are prepared that uh, however it evolves, whatever our task may be, uh, to be able to, uh, to adapt and, uh, and, and be flexible enough to, uh, to, to work with it. I, you know, I point out um, to, to some of the uh, uh, junior officers that I've worked with, um, my, my career spans a period of time where our relationship with, uh, with the government of Vietnam was, uh, was non-existent. We had just finished a, a, a long and difficult and, uh, and, and challenging war, uh, and no one in their right mind imagined that we would ever uh, have a situation where we'd be working on uh, partnership building uh, activities with, uh, with the Vietnamese military. Fast forward to where we are today, and, uh, and we have Vietnamese officers attending uh, many of our security conferences and working very closely with PACOM, and we're looking at other ways that we might be able to, uh, to, to partner together. So, so I guess the, the, the lesson of that is, is there's, you know, time moves on, situations change, we in the military have to be adaptable enough to be able to, uh, to, to respond in ways that, uh, that uh, we're directed to by our political leadership. Another question, um, looking back in time uh, from one former Cold Warrior to another. Um, the Russians, I, there was a, an interview by the Russian ambassador to the UN a couple of days ago, Anatoly uh, Turkin, and he, uh, he called the US-Russia relationship at this point uh, more tense than it has been since 1973 during the Arab-Israeli war when we almost came to, uh, to blows with the, the Russians. Um, what is your assessment of Russian operations in your AOR? Sure. Um, I'd be interested to hear um, 
how active you think they are. Uh, are they a real threat? Um, is it posturing uh, on their part? Uh, what, what is your assessment of, of, of their presence? You know, I, I think we can't afford to ignore their presence. Um, when you take a look, you look at Russia and you look at uh, what are their, their vital national interests, it's difficult to imagine that they have any vital national interests here in, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. That said, they are reinvesting a significant amount in uh, historical relations that the ships that they have had in Cuba, in Nicaragua, uh, in Venezuela. And so, you know, we have to watch that and recognize that if, uh, if we assume that they have uh, uh, a, a global perspective that is interlocked and inter interconnected, if you look at the types of activities that they have engaged in that, that violate the international norms and, and rules that, uh, uh, that society has come to expect, as we saw in Crimea and in, in uh, eastern Ukraine, that shouldn't allow a free pass for activities that they may be engaged in in other parts of the world. And I think it's, uh, we have to recognize they are a, a global country engaged in, uh, in global activities, and, and we have to be mindful. And what I find troubling is they are very aggressive in uh, a propaganda campaign uh, that, uh, to uh, spread the narrative that the United States is, uh, is not a reliable partner, uh, that we are withdrawing from the region, that uh, we don't care about what goes on in Latin America, and, uh, and Russia presents itself as a, as a viable alternative. And I think uh, we just need to recognize that whether we like it or not, they are engaged in a competition for influence, and we can acknowledge that, we can ignore that, or we can engage in the competition as well. Our, our choice is to find concrete ways to demonstrate to our partners, just as we did with uh, a rapid response to help uh, in the, the relief of Haiti, that we in fact are the most reliable partner, that we do care about our friends in this region, that we do work together and are reliable. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very, very noteworthy that when you look at the, at the response to Haiti, uh, we had, uh, at one point in time, 12 helicopters, heavy lift and medium lift helicopters flying vital aid, uh, meeting the needs of the Haitian people, and I didn't see any Russian helicopters out there. Great, oh, great, uh, great response. I'd like to open the, uh, the floor for questions now. We have until 11 o'clock precisely when uh, the Admiral needs to depart. Um, I ask that you state your, your name, your affiliation, and please keep your, uh, keep your question a question. Um, <laughs> Yes, <coughs> young lady here. Thank you, Amanda Macias, Business Insider. With all the threats that you've outlined and the aid that you've mentioned, how does the DOD's budget request stack up to that? Like, what are you missing, what do you need? Well, I, I probably should observe that I'm not responsible for the DOD budget request. I have a very, <laughs> very small piece of it. So um, I, I don't want to, I'm not ducking your question. I think. Um, our responsibility across all of the defense enterprises is to identify those areas, those requirements that we think we need to meet the tasks that, that uh, policy has determined we're responsible for. And uh, as you've seen uh, each year, the um, uh, DOD puts together a budget that attempts to meet those, uh, meet those demands. And then when there are deltas between what we think we need and, and, and what we end up getting, we have to decide what is it that we're not going to do. What of the tasks are we going to take? And, and, and the difference between what we're not going to do and, uh, and what we've been asked to do is, is risk. And it, it, it then becomes a, a question for, you know, for our, our, all of our population, for the American people to decide, am I, uh, am I satisfied that that's the right level of risk to, to be taking? But I think it's, uh, it, you know, we have, we, we have global interests, uh, we have global responsibilities, and, uh, and so we have, I think uh, an obligation to at least point out where we think uh, that, that, that we are not able to, to meet the mark to the degree that, that we think the American people are asking us to do. Yes, this gentleman here. Yes. Good morning, sir. Doug Hardison, General Atomics Aeronautical. And the question is uh, with regard to your relationship with Northcom. Uh, their AOR, AOR encompasses Mexico, I think Bahamas, and, and some portion of the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, you were talking earlier about networks and address countering networks. Is there, do you ha are you in the business of creating networks with DHS, Northcom, and if you can kind of talk about that? Absolutely, and in fact, um, <coughs> I probably should have mentioned that in, the, in, in my remarks. Um, 
Northcom and Southcom, I think, are, are, are inextricably linked together because these networks move from one, uh, um, one end of our theater to the other. And, and ultimately, all of our regional combatant commander's responsibility ultimately is defense of the homeland. And so, you know, we, we have a piece of the away game, and, uh, and Northcom has, has more of the home game, and we need to make sure that there are absolutely no gaps or seams. I, I can tell you I've met multiple times with General Robinson and with, uh, with Admiral Gortney before her um, to make sure that we see the world through a, a, a common perspective. Uh, and in fact, now working NORTHCOM, SOUTHCOM, and uh, U.S. Special Operations Command, who have a unique, I think, uh, expertise at looking at networks and understanding networks and, and working with us on this to, to, to understand, as we look at, at the movement of peoples, and particularly people that might potentially pose a, uh, a challenge, uh, how can we better support Depart the Department of Homeland Security, who they've got kind of the ultimate responsibility for Homeland Security, so we play a supporting role in that and making sure that uh, the information that we are able to, uh, to develop that is, uh, it's, it's well shared and that we support their needs. The uh, Operation Citadel that I mentioned in, the, uh, uh, in my remarks, uh, that's, that specifically is focused on the movement of, uh, of, of potentially move, or potential movement of, uh, of, of people who may pose a threat to the United States. So how do we collectively, we DOD collectively support DHS in that effort? But uh, so the three combatant commanders, we all work very closely together. As, a, as an enterprise, as a network, a friendly network, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to do everything we possibly can do to, to make sure that uh, something doesn't come from uh, at least the southern approaches. Yeah. Yes, in, in the far back. Admiral, uh, some examples, say three, of how specifically the maritime networks penetrate the U.S., and what do we do to counter that? Uh, so your, your question is with regard to uh, adversary networks that, uh, that, that come into the U.S. I th is, that, is that, if I understand your question? I think, um, you know, if you look at the history of the, of the, the challenge that we've had with um, uh, trafficking in drugs to pick one commodity, but one that we've probably been focused on most heavily, uh, We've seen that uh, they, they initially moved up through the Caribbean in, uh, in small boats. Uh, that was squeezed down hard, and so they moved out into uh, further offshore and into the Central Caribbean and, and then along the Pacific coast of, of Central America. And as we squeezed hard there, they moved further offshore. Uh, they began to develop the semi and, and fully submersible craft uh, to evade detection uh, and, and to be able to move product up further up into uh, Central America and that where it then came in overland. Uh, we've seen instances of uh, uh, container shipping uh, being used to, uh, to, to smuggle drugs into, uh, into the country. Uh, but I think that's the, the, the nature of these networks is uh, if we focus exclusively on the commodity, there's a tendency for the networks to adapt and to change and to, to find ways around the, the steps that we've taken. If we look at the network itself and try to find ways to apply pressure uniformly across the length and breadth of the networks, so that we actually disrupt the networks themselves through a combination of law enforcement activities and just driving them uh, out of business, um, that's where we have the greatest, uh, greatest opportunity. But it, it, we've we got we to gotta step back and focus on the network and not, not just on what it is that they're moving and measure our success if we can. And that's, this, is, this is hard new business to, you know, to, to apply metrics that, uh, that are meaningful to. How do you measure defeat of a network? Uh, because they morph and they move and they change and they adapt and so but but recognizing you have a problem I think is the first step in, uh, in trying to tackle it and so that's what uh, what we're trying to do yes this gentleman here yeah, Steve. Uh, this you could, could idea, I've heard recently you know from a number of senior people that the Caribbean basin in general is an ideal place to experiment to innovate to work new offset strategies, new structures, new platforms. Is there a thinking that brings together these types of things into this region that's close to home and uh, perhaps uh, amenable to a lots of types of experimentation and innovation? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you, you identify an, you know, a, an ideal situation and I know you know, innovation is kind of the, the, the sexy word of the day and everybody is, uh, is, is chasing and trying to prove how innovative they are. Um, what we offer is, 
a, a regional combatant command that has you know, what we believe to be a, um, a challenging type of an adversary that we are dealing with, with a meaningful mission that, is, uh, that it's not an exercise, it's not an artificial uh, activity, but it's a, it's, it is a, it's a task that, uh, that, that is worth doing. Uh, and so my commitment is uh, to whether it's the services, whether it's uh, our research and development organizations, our labs, try it here first. If you've got something that maybe is being developed, a capability, a technology, a, 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 just a, a, a tactics, technique, or procedure that's being developed perhaps for a, another theater, perhaps a higher threat theater, and you want to get a little bit of runtime and get some valid, meaningful data collection, um, my commitment and the commitment of, of the U.S. Southcom headquarters is we're close, you know, basically, you know, more or less the same time zones. Uh, we're relatively uh, convenient to get to, and I can promise that, uh, that we will do everything that we possibly can to eliminate any bureaucratic hurdles that might lie in the way. Uh, so our answer is yes. Now let's talk about what the problem is. But the motto, try it here first, is, uh, is something that we're trying to put, uh, you know, uh, put some real... Um, meaning into that and we've had a number of, uh, of initiatives that we're beginning to get off the ground now working with uh, with the services but uh, you know we, we can't think of an, an easier place to, to come and try things out and uh, then then to do it down in Southcom. Yeah. Gentleman in the far back. Hi Admiral Kevin Wensing uh, in the Navy League. Hi, how are you sir? Uh, a couple questions actually. One on cybersecurity. How would you, how do you deal with that? Is that a big issue for you? And then economic development and how that can help uh, sort of alleviate some of the problems in uh, South America and Central America have. Um, I'll take the second one, not because it's easy, but because the answer is uh, is probably you know obvious. Economic and development, uh, particularly in our region, go hand in hand. You can't have economic development unless you have security. You can't have security long-term security unless you have economic development. So, so that is uh, the core of the policy, particularly with regard to, to Central America and the work that DOD is, is, uh, is engaged in, but also all of the work of Department of State and, uh, and other entities within the U.S. government to, to try to tackle the, uh, the enormous security challenges in Central America. Um, with regard to, uh, see, the, the first part of your question, uh, cyber, yeah. Who's not worried about cyber? I think is probably the uh, you know the the, the operative question. Um, uh, all of our security partners that we uh, that we work with in the region have all expressed uh, concern, interest, uh, and a, and a desire to try to to come to grips with this. And and different countries are are, are taking steps to try and develop the capabilities. Uh, initially, obviously, for cyber defense and to and to recognize the vulnerabilities that are there, and then to take the steps to secure their networks. And so when we come together and we work together uh, as, a, as, as a team, and we had an opportunity to, uh, to test this out during our, our Panamax exercise is, you know, you've got a multinational team. Uh, you've got to be able to communicate effectively. You've got to be able to exchange information effectively. And so you create uh, a, a network that uh, allows you to exchange information in a, in, a, in a secure environment, and then you've got to protect that network. And then we practice banging on that network and see how well we do. And it's a challenge. Um, the other piece is in the, as we look at how do you deal with adversaries use of the, of the cyber domain, and how do you practice and work your way through that. And you know, we've, we, are, we are still, as we continue to sort of mature the thinking on, on command and control for, for cyber operations, and what's the appropriate role? Is it played at the, at the combatant commander level? Is it played at a centralized level? And as we work our way through that, and so we, we tried out a couple of different, uh, different ways during the exercise to see how we might uh, get after this problem, recognizing uh, it will take time to create a core of, of uh, fully trained um, cyber operators, uh, and that that will probably be centrally managed for some significant period of time. What we try to do is identify what are the effects that we want to achieve in the cyber domain, perhaps denying the cyber domain to, a, uh, to an exercise adversary? Uh, so rather than us having the organic capability to do that, we identify what, what are we trying to achieve, and then we turn to, uh, to a, a uh, um, in this case, uh, uh, U.S. Cybercom that was participating in the exercise and say, you know, I don't need to know, I don't need to have the expertise to do it. This is what I want to achieve over to you to make it happen. N not 
all that different if you think about it, you know, kind of philosophically from the way we initially began to apply air power. Uh, and we went through the d debates and the discussions that, you know, everybody needs to have their own owned um, organic uh, aviation capability that, that was able to, to, to have handle the full spectrum of, of air power. And then we realized, well, no, we can actually work on this together. And as a commander, I need to identify what are my needs, what are my requirements, turn that over to my an aviation or an air component commander, let the air component commander say, this is how I plan to meet your needs, and then apply the, uh, the, the uh, conduct operations to ideally achieve that effect. And if not, then we say, okay, you didn't quite hit the mark, let's go back and try again. I don't know if that's ultimately going to be the, you know, the, the, the future way that we do business, but we thought we would give that a try, given that you know, it, it may be a long time before I have a full up, 100% capable across the full spectrum of cyber operations uh, uh, organic to, to U.S. Southcom, but, but maybe I don't need it. Maybe all I need to do is accurately and clearly identify what my requirements are, what effects I want to achieve, turn it over, and then see, did it work, did it not work, and you know, let's try again. So we're working on it, we're talking it, we're exercising it, we're testing out some new ideas, but uh, you know, it's something that obviously everybody's very interested in. Yes, this gentleman here. Good morning, sir. Uh, Captain Rodelus, French Navy. I have a question regarding the uh, uh, information slash intel sharing with other countries. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, in your uh, uh, counter, uh, counter th um, network uh, approach that we need to work together, and I know it's very difficult either uh, even in interagency uh, to share information, to work together, and it's even more difficult with other countries. So I would like to have your views on this topic. You know, it, it, uh, I, will, I will tell you that over, oh, I suppose the 15 years or so where I've been in, a, in, in command that included a multinational partner in the, in the uh, in that command relationships, whether it was a, a maritime task force in the, in the Persian Gulf, whether it was uh, a carrier strike group, uh, whether it was uh, a, a na the naval component of U.S. Southcom and now at U.S. Southcom, um, if you are going to work with partners, which, which we are going to work with partners, we don't have the capacity to do everything that we might want to do uh, internationally, so we will work with partners. We will. Uh, and particularly military partners with whom we have a long-standing relationship. So if you're going to do that, you've got to be able to build trust. The partners have to trust each other or, or you, you might as well stop. How do you build trust with an international partner? You, you have to be able to talk to each other. You have to be able to exchange information. I, I, look, I, I get, I understand the, um, the sensitivities that all of us have, every single partner has on how did I gather that information? What were the sources and methods that we go through? And we don't need to get involved in that, but we need to be able to exchange the information. We need to say, this is what I know. What do you know? How do you want to work this together? How can we coordinate our activities? And so if you don't have a means of doing that, you can't build trust. And if you don't have trust, you don't have a partnership or a relationship. So that's the, I mean, that's the, the kind of the foundational aspect of it that I see. And what I've found is it doesn't happen from the bottom up. It has to, it's commander's business. It's the commanders have got to come in and say, this is important, we're going to do this, it's going to hurt, I'm going to have to accept a certain amount of risk that, that I no longer have full control, but if I don't build a partnership with that, with that individual, uh, that country, that, uh, that, that, that unit that, uh, that, that is going to be either part of your, of your task force or that's going to be part of your coalition. If you can't establish that trust, um, you're, you're kind of out of business. So, but that's, that's got to start at the very top and, and you have to hammer on it every single day because we have plenty of ways that, uh, that, that, we, that we compromise trust and so we've got to work on it all the time. So I think we have time for two more quick questions. This gentleman here had a question. Um, and then the young lady in the back. Hi, Benjamin Din, Medill News Service. Um, what are your thoughts about yesterday's conviction of General Cartwright? And maybe we can take the second um, question. Uh, well, go. no, I, 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 I was going to say let me let me just go ahead and pass on that one because I, I'm I'm not familiar with the details of the of the case. So, thanks. Hi, Caroline Hauk, Defense One. Um, you spoke a lot about 
transnational or, uh, organizations and networks. One of the things that we've seen in other areas is the integration of sp state sponsored activity with traditional international criminal networks, whether we're talking, say, Russian hacking or integration of the North Korean top leadership with um, their finances with other international networks. To what extent have you seen that in your area of responsibility? And if possible, can you provide examples, whether it's, say, a local state sponsored activity or foreign coming into um, Southcom's area? I, I, I think we've seen um, enormous activity by criminal entities. And then as you begin to pull, you know, peel the layers back, what are, the, what are their origins? What are their, um, where are they, are they uh, what are their motivations? Um, and I probably should um, just be very, very general in terms of what I discuss in, in this environment. Um, because of the sensitivities involved. But I, I, it, I, I would say that clearly we have seen, um, um, we've seen criminal entities that uh, engage in some pretty, uh, uh, pretty illicit activity, things that, uh, that, that, that give great concern, uh, that lead to the significant instability, and then the competition for control of those activities uh, that leads to, uh, to, to a lot of the violence that, uh, that we see in, the, um, in Central America. Um, the connections of those criminal activities, I think, uh, probably just just say we're you know we're very interested in them and continue to follow. And it's when you get into the business of following the money, following the uh, where those lead that, uh, that that I think will will bear some interesting fruit. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all very much. I wanted to to first, on behalf of the U.S. Naval Institute and Admiral Daly, um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you again to Lockheed Martin and HII for making this series possible. And uh, we all join in thanking you, Admiral Tid, for joining us today. This was a very, very useful uh, dialogue. My pleasure for coming. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.